Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to MIDC's Walk and Talk series. My name is Mark Rupert. I'll be your host today. Our special guest today is Iyad Osaka. He's a partner at LMA. He's responsible for the work in the MENA region. And today, uh, Iyad will be talking about uh, construction automation. Uh, let's see. So if you have any questions or uh, questions you want to post, you can post them on the chat. You'll see that at the top of your screen. And at the end, we'll uh, attempt to answer those questions. So without further ado, Iyad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I would like to um, take you through today our experience at OMA for the last couple of uh, decades and putting almost every possible effort to try to push uh, the issue of construction automation. You know, to kind of try to catch up of with the with the rest of the manufacturing industries. It's a very complex issue. Uh, we tried. There are so many different aspects to it the, related to developers, architects, designers, financiers, construction, building materials. Uh, quite a complex cycle. We worked on it from different aspects, working from precast system to modular constructions, um, but I think the best way I can describe it is when you uh, describe it as design for manufacturing and assembly. Um, and um, I would like to share with you a presentation today, well, to take you through through a little bit of history um, um, of our experience and then some project that we have designed and some project that we have executed using a design for manufacturing and uh, assembly. And then a look at almost aspects of what is the challenging, especially nowadays when it comes to uh, the issue of COVID-19, uh, the impact that it has on social distancing, the impact that it has on construction sites, on offices, on manufacturers, so more and more, it's kind of imperative to kind of start thinking about uh, design for manufacturing and assembly. Uh, not to mention, obviously, all the issues related to the construction industry uh, emissions, uh, level of emission, the construction industry contribution to global warming and climate change. So I'll, I'll start through and uh, take you uh, through the uh, presentation. So th this slide, uh, that it's not a COVID-19 uh, slide that we've seen for the last five, six months. It's, it is actually the uh, human population since the uh, Homo sapiens surfaced on the Earth 200,000 years ago. You can see almost since the 1900, we started at 1.65 billion to today in uh, almost 120 years, we are at 7.8 billion. Today, more and more, the issue that related to housing is uh, a necessity, it is imperative. There is housing demand in almost every aspect um, in every country. The Western world or the developed world have stepped forward and made a lot of advances when it comes to the automation of the construction industry, talking about uh, uh, modular construction, talking about precast system. However, today the biggest demand is in the develop, developing countries, countries like, uh, for example, China, India, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the Middle East, uh, South America, and uh, we, as OMA, we're trying very hard for the last decade to have a dialogue with developers and contractors where we operate in this country to push the envelope for construction automation and not to repeat almost the mistake that the developed world have taken for the last hundred years when it comes to repeating the same mistake when it comes to the construction cycle itself. Um, um, from all our research that we have to get to, from all the challenges that that can push the construction industry, we got to the point that one of the 
leading aspect or one of the major challenges is lays in the designer itself. You know, the designers need to take a lead. Architects and engineers need, need to take a lead to push this envelope. It starts from them and then from there it flow to the different aspect of the development and construction industry. A little bit of history, this is the Crystal Palace in London. It was in 1951, every element of the Crystal Palace was uh, modular. Every element of it was done off-site and then assembled on-site. Uh, so there is a, a really strong uh, precedence for this. This is the Japan uh, after the Second World War, obviously all over the world in the devastated city, the architects took a very strong role on how to rebuild the city and uh, the automation of construction was one of the and the resilience of the building was when the main aspect considered. So the metabolism movement in Japan, for example, this is Tokyo in 1945. This is Isozaki floating um, uh, cluster in the air where the issue that related to hovering city above uh, clusters in the air, the hovering cities. Uh, this is the uh, United Kingdom, London, after the Second World War, also 1945. Here, the Archigram movement led by Peter Cook, you know, envisaged to have almost um, uh, a city that a hybrid between a transportation uh, and a city itself, where different element of the city continue to move uh, between one element, they call it the block in city. Uh, this is one of the collages that we are worked. Uh, it was done by Warren Chalk, you know, and this is envisaged, for example, how you can build modular construction in the city itself and then literally move around uh, the pots for different uses and different elements providing more resilience in the city. Uh, in the Netherlands, this is Rotterdam, is also 1945, completely again uh, devastated by the war. Pete Plume um, uh, envisaged something he called it uh, Noah's Ark, where a gigantic urban design for housing that can house millions of people you know, um, into more, um, an, call it an interurban city. And all these elements were based on the issue that related to uh, structuralism and uh, mobility, adaptability and expandability. Uh, so it goes from almost, um, um, uh, this is the saying of the thinker, of the architecture thinker of that era, working on the issue that related to the construction uh, modularity and the construction manufacturing itself, you know. So after almost 50 years of talking about this element, the kind of utopia of the 1960s and the modular construction shifted to uh, what is the 2000 reality? Almost um, this is how everybody perceive uh, the uh, modular construction. This is how everybody look into the uh, prefabricated uh, element. This is the only, uh, it's a serious stigma uh, for this method of the construction. Now, all the other manufacturing um, uh, from the car industry to the aircraft industry, they all started with the single uh, production here, went to the assembly line, went into the modular assembly and into fully robotic modular assembly. Only the construction industry to date, you know, we continue to doing the same thing again and again. We do construction almost in an assembly line. You know, the method has not been changed you know, and it has serious challenges to it. Uh, so we have next to us uh, an advanced manufacturing that almost um, achieve uh, one to two percent wastage um, in their manufacturing process, speed and so on. And we stuck in this kind of repetitive vicious cycle of doing the construction through the assembly line itself. No. Um, the the manufacturing industry and uh, and I'm, when I talk about manufacturing industry, I'm not talking about cars and airplanes. I'm talking about every aspect of the in industrial or manufacturing industry. They pushed their productivity through utilization of modularization. And uh, when I talk about modularization, I'm not talking about 
volumetric rooms or volumetric uh, rigid modules. We're talking about element of architecture that can be all uh, modulized and then assembled on site. And later on, you will see what does that mean. Um, if you compare, for example, uh, the the uh, where uh, the the value per worker in the manufacturing line and the value of worker on the construction line, it's almost 1.7 uh, uh, X in the manufacturing. There's a huge difference between how the construction industry does uh, their uh, or develop uh, buildings and how the manufacturing does it itself. The only way we think that we can move forward is by um, really into the assimilation and the mimicry of the manufacturing industry. You know, and, and again, I go back to car. Car is one of the biggest uh, example of, um, of how this can be done itself. Um, lately, there is this book uh, that done, um, was written by Andrew McAfee. It's called More From Less. It's a super interesting book, very optimistic book you know, about humanity in general, but how also the manufacturing and the intelligence of, of humanity managed to evolve every aspect of our life um, uh, to the better. You know, but at the same time, uh, the book clearly states where one industry is lacking behind, and it is our industry, it is the construction industry itself. You know. For example, I highly encourage reading this book. You read here how even you know, your, your Coca-Cola can uh, shifted uh, the weight of the Coca-Cola pen in 20 years, shifted almost um, a tenth of its weight. This weight is all based on scientific research to make aluminium thinner, lighter. Obviously, it saves money for manufacturer, it makes it more recyclable. Every, as everything we look around us, um, uh, every plastic, every phone, every laptop, every can, continuously evolve and becomes better to save money, but at the same time to be better for the environment and so on, except our industry. I highly recommend this book because, again, it talks about almost every aspect that we, from as a, in the development and the construction industry, we can benefit from. The car industry today, if we take an example, a company like VW, work on a principle called batch engineering. You have tire three, where every element from the engine to the tires, um, to, to the handle, to the bottoms, it's all made uh, off-site from a different area and through the blockchains, um, uh, you produce also tire two. And from these different brands of VW, i.e. you know, Volkswagen, Seat and Skoda and Audi, use exactly tire three and tire two and then cosmetically work on the final product. You know, these four cars have the same tire one and two element. And this is how you achieve modularity. If you talk about the car industry today, for example, BMW have to prove that 90% of its car are recyclable. Show me one building that have to show uh, that 90% of what we design and do are 90% recyclable. It's almost impossible. Well, uh, in Holland here, uh, apart from the building industry, which is when it comes to building um, office building or residential building, there's a lot of use of pre-cut system uh, for all kind of consideration like environmental, noise restriction, um, working in a very harsh weather of rain and wind all the time. And uh, because of this necessity, the precast and the assembly is site, uh, assembly on site assembled or evolved uh, drastically for the last uh, uh, 20 years. But there is another aspect of the uh, what the Dutch call as a joke here as a national sport, where all this housing, uh, single dwelling more or less, or town housing, almost every half a decade, they go through this cycle where they uh, create, put outside, they almost take the house completely, trash the house from the inside and redo it again. And the amount of environmental waste and the waste of this construction is unparalleled. 
something that the government here, for example, trying very hard to restrict or to work on it or give the individual incentive not to do that or using alternative method. But coming back to batch engineering, we think that the same, and I will show you in the example that we designed, can be applied to the construction industry where the basic element, like for example here, as a, as a just a single example, tier three could be the chest, the, the modular system, window door, pipes, uh, uh, light switches, and so on. Tier two could be the volumetric condition of, of the, for example, living, and then shift into building. Obviously, the innovation of the architect can go far, far more. It could be five tires, six tires, and so on. You know? But if you talk about not the car industry, even if you talk about other uh, simple example, Nike, for example, used to make exactly the same shoes, but now allow you to go on their website and take the same shoes and almost uh, with so-called Nike ID, you know, almost um, uh, edit it and change it into different aspect. And the same can be applied to as an example. Lego started by the simple blocks and then it evolved now into a massive industry, you know, where you have almost this single Lego block can almost build unlimited um, shapes and, and um, uh, condition itself, you know. Obviously, the degree of industrialization in the, in the construction industry, it is all the way. The free fabrication is very big. The mechanization is very big. Automation in a lot of basic elements is big. Robotic and nowadays we are working a lot on the uh, 3D printing. You know, 3D printing today, we, uh, for example, at OMA, we utilize it in, in uh, a lot of facade engineering. Um, uh, in Holland, they use a lot of 3D printing in facade engineering made of recyclable material. You know. um, for us, the, the on-site construction challenges, um, as you all know it, it goes into, first of all, low productivity, market competitiveness. You know, uh, in other words, architecture is such a slow profession. Any building you work on, it will uh, the life cycle of design and construction is between three to four years. You know, the, today, uh, the markets in general, especially for developers, are so vulnerable that actually you wouldn't know what's going to happen from now to four years. So you start the cycle of the design of the building now, and then by the time you finish in four years, the whole the whole market um, would have, have changed. The demand, for example, from one bedroom to two bedroom to three bedroom would have changed. Uh, um, a hotel, for example, like today, as you can from COVID-19, the, the devastation of, uh, of, of the hospitality industry. What do you do about it? How can you make the building resilient enough that this hotel can change into a hospital or can change into a school or can change into a uh, residential? Um, so this kind of uh, issue that the standard uh, on-site construction doesn't have such a resilient. Obviously, there is very low predictability when it comes cost and time. Um, and very, there is uh, no inflexibility at all. The building, as I said, doesn't have any second life. But more importantly, issue related to resource wastage and negative environmental impact. If you take one by one, um, the latest statistic we got as of almost 2015, um, there is almost um, there is hardly any project delivered on a budget itself. You know, um, there is incredible um, unpredictability uh, when it comes uh, to achieving the construction budget or the construction budget assigned. Um, and the reason why, because of the cycle of the design uh, going into concepts, schematic design, no matter how much do you do value engineering, because you don't have any dialogue with the contractors, or manufacturers, or you're not designing for manufacturing at early stages, you leave your design always vulnerable to the market trends when you go to tendering. You know, and here uh, we're all familiar with the issue that related to lump sum contract and how predictability it is. 
when we go, when we talk and discuss, for example, standard practices of um, um, standard contractors um, in, uh, for example, in any region, you see uh, the, the contractor have more people sitting on the claim, more than actually the engineers who are working on site. So uh, um, the, the, the whole tendering process is a very vicious product, uh, process. You go into low prices, you see vulnerability in the design, and then you decide to go and claim on site. This issue almost can be eliminated when you kind of uh, design for manufacturing where, where the design parameters is almost fixed at early stages and when you have more a dialogue with the manufacturer and with, with the contractor at early stage. The other issue is there's buildings have no second life. The only life it has is demolition. Uh, and I will show you later on examples of how building can have a, a second life itself. Uh, when you use, for example, volumetric uh, modular construction, um, one of the manufacturers that we work with here in the Netherlands, uh, you can go to their yards today and see a lot of uh, modular units, modular units that disassembled from building itself, put at the manufacturer, taken, refurbished, and sent back again. Almost every wire is saved, every tile is saved, every element of the of the building that we know is uh, reuse itself. Nothing has been demolished, you know. So the 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 issue of of the second life of building is very important. Obviously, we all seen these pictures how things can go very wrong in the con in the construction industry. The examples is all around us. The vulnerability, especially on the issue related to. Uh, again, uh, climate change and uh, vulnerability, or the, the issue that related to design error, uh, construction error, uh, wasted material. Uh, today, they estimate that 25 to 30 percent um, of every material we use on site are wasted. Cutting tiles, uh, uh, you know, paint, element, wires, uh, the construction industry weight is unparalleled itself. You know. This is just a, a simple example to show you. Um, uh, we today, you know, we contribute to almost 32 percent of the total waste uh, worldwide from the kind of construction waste itself. You know, uh, um, uh, the um, it estimated that only in China, if the landfill height is set at 20 meter, it would cover 375 million square meters. I mean. I know this is statistic, but this is also staggered figures to just to almost comprehend it. No, um, 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 but this is how much we contribute uh, only to the uh, uh, the waste on this earth itself. The offsite construction obviously have a lot of other advantages or counter advantages. One of them is the high productivity, market competitiveness, high predictability, cost and time, high flexibility, multiple life and minimal resources waste. You know, when it comes to reduced time, uh, uh, we estimate now that the average schedule reduction is almost about 40%. I'll give you an example uh, of the uh, one of the company that we work here in the south of Holland itself. They've been doing modular construction specifically for the almost for the last um, 100 years. We use them to design a couple of towers in Abu Dhabi that I will show you later on. The manufacturing lines that they have in the south of Holland here contain 80 skilled waiter or, or worker, 8-0. This goes from welders, builders, electrician, window manufacturers, and uh, almost every um, skilled labor you can think of. This 80 individual manufacturer from basically the modular construction all the way to the finish the way it's wrapped at the end of the the manufacturing line and I'm talking about every light fitting, every light switch, uh, plaster, paint, door handles, everything except the loose furniture. They make every day almost 240 square meters of finished product. You know, 240 square meters ready wrapped for transportation to be assembled on site, you know. A building of almost 
10,000 square meter could be assembled on site, connected and commissioned in less than two months after the, and I will show you the cycle of a specific, uh, an example, for example, when it comes to that. So reduced time is a, is a big deal. When you talk about today emergency situation like war zones, uh, where you need field hospital, for example, this is where such a construction like hospitals, which has to be impeccable, becomes a necessity always to use such a system. You can ship them by uh, by sea and assemble hospital almost in, in no time. Uh, when it comes today, the COVID-19 uh, uh, again conditions, no, where uh, countries run out of medical facilities and ICU unit again, here where you have modular construction, it become uh, almost a lifesaver itself. You know? The other issue obviously related is the, the earlier return of investments. You know? So here in a simple example, for example, of, of we estimated in an office space, you know, a 25% schedule reduction can save you almost $152,000 saved in construction interest, you know, i.e. the finances and almost $290,000 of rental income, you know, in uh, coming up uh, uh, immediately. The same example goes for the retail. I'm sure you can also calculate it for all the other aspects like residential, hospitality and so on. You now, this specific issue that uh, return on investment has stigma that related to the financial institute and that I will speak about uh, later. Again, the issue that related to uh, reduction of cost. Um, uh, today, uh, for example, the, the Mayo, the com uh, modular construction is one of the companies that we work with and we have estimated, worked with them uh, to have their building in comparison to conventional construction have almost a 30% cheaper than uh, than the standard conventional system. The other issue that it is really crucial when you go to um, a manufacturing uh, element, uh, a construction element um, uh, manufacturing facility, the issue of safety is very important. Um, uh, um, I remember taking one client actually from Abu Dhabi to the south of Holland and we um, I took him through the whole manufacturing line. You know, we walked almost, I think, 1.2 kilometers uh, through almost a loop. And then when we end up at the wrapping condition of the modular unit, um, he told me, he said, incredible, I never seen anything like this. But then he gave me something really interesting. He, he said, look at my black shoes, it's not even dusty. Uh, we went through a cycle of 1.2 kilometers of concreting, uh, uh, um, all kind of work, tiling or whatever, the impeccable condition of a environmentally controlled uh, manufacturing line, it, it, there was no dust even in his black shoes. I mean, that element that I never thought of it almost convinced him to take his building that I will show you later into this um, into modular uh, construction itself. The other thing that it is uh, really important is, is the safety of the workers. You know, um, every worker obviously are skilled workers. They know what they are doing. They come in um, and they do a very specific task like you are making uh, a car, like you are making a phone. Um, there is another aspect that I will, I will show you later on the specifically on the modular construction that I think is important to talk about where we talk about now robotic um, introduction into the um, into it itself. Um, the other thing, as we know, one of the biggest issue when it comes to the process or the administration of the uh, construction site is the issue related to change order when you almost every element of the design is, is resolved in the first two months and sent to manufacturing, change order become almost nil. You know, and that's also um, a very kind of uh, big issue. Uh, again, uh, the issue of high predictability for developers when it comes to cost and time is a very big deal. Um, the commitment 
when you do a business plan as a developer, you do it, let's say, uh, when you commence a project, you know, at the first year cycle of the project, by the time the design is over, you know, the whole market dynamic could have changed, no matter how much contingencies you have there, most probably it will not be sufficient, you know, to deal with the escalation of the market uh, um, and so on. So again, you can more or less guarantee a better predictability at the early stage of the design when you establish your feasibility plan. Uh, uh, feasibility consultants come at the first three months and then leave. It doesn't stick with you for the next four years, you know. Um, and, and, and this is crucial to try to pin down this as early as, as this, you know. Resources waste is one of the biggest deal. You know, you, you work on issues related to uh, reduce labor. Uh, uh, you reduce the amount of labor w when it comes uh, on site itself, you know, uh, reduce of material and reduce in time. However, um, I mainly, for, on behalf of OME, I operate in, in countries where it, the issue of reduced labor has um, a different fa uh, facade to it, so a different reaction to it. So, for example, when we try to introduce the issue of the automated construction and um, and modular construction in a country like India or um, uh, Egypt, for example, here labor is very cheap, labor is very abundant. The developers and the authority saw the issue of reduced labor as a serious issue. Um, uh, for them, it's um, it almost damage the economy because we are trying to cut down um, on people's livelihood. You know? And um, uh, what I mentioned today, in Holland we need 80 people to do 240 square meter. We estimate we need almost, you know, over 400, you know, laborers to do exactly the same job in, a, in the conventional site itself, you know. So in a place like India or in a place like Egypt or in a place in Sub-Sahara Africa, this issue was a serious uh, thing to think about. What do we do with these people? What are the alternative way of living uh, that they need uh, to, to consider for them? So this is one of the issues that when you think about, again, uh, the automation of the construction that we need to consider. But at the same time, uh, the agriculture industry uh, the manufacturing industry went exactly through this dilemma and they came out of it. You know? And I think it is something need to be looked at more deeply in certain countries and look at it. If you look at a, a country like the Gulf region, for example, the issue of reduced labor, uh, labor was very welcome. The reason is um, labor in the Gulf country like the Emirates and Saudi and, and Kuwait and so on is a liability. All the labors are important. You know, um, you have to house them, you have to transport them, you know, um, uh, income, um, uh, rights, um, and so on. Uh, so lately, for the last decade, laborers in this country become a serious liability. So the idea of uh, construction automation, you know, and um, modular construction are extremely welcomed, actually, from the leadership all the way to the top, all the way to the, con you know, to the uh, uh, contractors. Uh, um, so again, this issue is varied from one uh, country to uh, uh, another itself. Uh, the issue that high flexibility becomes really important, I will show you later on in the example, for example, uh, uh, that our, the design that we did uh, for one of the buildings in Abu Dhabi, um, facing become really important. You can li literally take the modular construction and manipulate it in different way. And here it shows as obviously as a Lego, but um, um, the the uh, the uh, is just a diagram. So obviously the 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 design itself is uh, is almost unlimited of what you can do with it. But the same way you can way you grow the building, you can literally also shrink building. You can relocate buildings. Um, here, for example, in in, in Holland. Um, uh, one of the school in, in, in Amsterdam, for example, it was um, it was grown and shrinked and moved almost three four times using exactly the same module modules uh, system. You know? 
The other thing which is really important, again, taking the chassé itself uh, uh, of, uh, or the Mondial itself and almost adapted to a different usage. You know, um, uh, a residential module is no different than uh, a hotel module or a hospital module. Uh, or um, so, so there is certain uh, type of typology that share a lot that you can almost uh, interchange um, bet between them itself. Uh, um, the, the, the other word, and this is what I mentioned earlier, earlier for example, here, uh, the Dutch manufacturer of modular construction contributed tremendously to the housing in 2015 and 16 uh, of, of the refugee inflow that came from country like um, um, uh, Syria, uh, where Germany suddenly uh, was confronted with over half a million refugees in less than six months. You know, and again, um, uh, the Dutch modular construction manufacturers use the stock that existed um, uh, in their factories to immediately introduce housing, um, uh, proper housing that and, sh and shipped it um, immediately to Germany itself. You know, and again, it was all based on the fact that could be again disassembled and relocated and assembled in a different condition itself. No, uh, we worked uh, with a lot of uh, environmental consultants um, uh, when it comes to uh, showing uh, the the advantages um, and try to promote the issue that related to design for manufacturing and assembly. Uh, this is, for example, a sheet that done by one of the leaders in environmental building studies called RDWI. RDWI literally uh, their research and their actual experience again um, confirmed our assumptions 20 to 30 percent saving construction 40 50 percent construction on uh, on time 50 percent construction wastage you know and and this is really crucial also i mean you see the impact 70 percent less transport visit to the site i mean this is crucial again uh, uh, with the ozone uh, with the emissions no um, Certain condition where speed is important, um, a manufacturing assembly can do 24-7 uh, um, under any condition, heat, non-heat, it's a, it's a factory setting, cold or not cold or hot, it, it can work. Uh, the reusability issue and again, the construction quality and the better energy performance. The better energy performance come literally from, again, the controlled environment of the construction process itself and the monitoring itself. Um, so in a nutshell, just, just show you a comparison uh, between what is our finding between an on-site construction, i.e. the single assembly line and the automated contraction or kind of batch manufacturing for the uh, construction. So the productivity, uh, the, the uh, skilled labor, factory trained workforce, uh, the wastage, uh, the, uh, the issue that related to site assembly, less coordination on site, uh, the increase, the very crucial issue of safety and the weather condition. Uh, so this is one of the projects that we have done in Abu Dhabi. And um, uh, when you think about how, what does it mean to do um, uh, a design uh, for construction and assembly, or what the you know DF um, uh, MA. First of all, the the you have to discuss. Obviously, the developer have to trigger uh, um, the the process itself. The developer has to agree that his building, you know, will have to be on that basis itself. So the architect will commission the design on the principles of. Um, the uh, the design for manufacturing assembly, whether it is elemental, different element, or whether it is uh, uh, volumetric, i.e. modular system, so both system itself. So the concept design would work on that basis, so i.e. every element, every room, every bathroom, every kitchen, uh, every ceiling, all the elements will be almost designed on that basis. You know, you know, bathroom woods will be calculated 
on the what kind of tiles uh, that you put. Is it 20 by 20, 30 by 30? So that's mean the width of the bathroom is that, no? So you work also on the basis to avoid wastage uh, almost. But this is from the conceptual stage. But it means also that by the conclusion of the of almost concept design and SD design itself, you know, here the developer also have a, a much bigger responsibility. Almost every element uh, or of the uh, the development itself has to be decided, you know, because the 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 process when it goes, for example, when it comes to volumetric or modular construction, by the time you are working and and on the SD itself, you know, uh, the procurement design start. Uh, uh, so the contractor, you have to engage with the contractor, you have to tender after SD uh, based on this element. And then once you appoint the contractor, they will start the, pr the procurement of all the element itself. Uh, and here the architect would almost stop because uh, the contractor will shift into uh, their own workshop drawings and the architect will only be the approval. So there will be no more uh, uh, DD, CD, uh, and so on, because the procurement process immediately started. No, and after the procurement process started, you go into uh, almost production. Uh, at the same time, in certain condition where you need in situ, like uh, element uh, related to deep excavation or basement, or I will show you later, for example, where you do hyper conditions. You know, um, these can already start on site itself, and by the time by the element is all uh, produced, transportation, and then almost into assembly. But this shows you already, you know, all the issue, the contract, I mean, all our experience, every time you finish a concept, you know, you work in SDDD, and here the client continuously almost adapting, changing, their mind all the way to the procurement process, no? And then even when you start the construction, all kind of change order continue to happen and take shape. The challenge obviously in, in this modular or, or kind of um, um, design for construction and assembly that you, all these issues related to change order cannot be accommodated anymore. It is made, it is coming on site, and the building itself, because designed on this aspect, it cannot accommodate changes. Um, um, and again, when it in the right conditions, you know, and if you and conceptually worked on the basis on, on design um, uh, of, of design for uh, uh, manufacturing and assembly, the uh, there is no the contractor does not allow high overhead. It does not allow 30% wastage. All these elements disappear. Or, uh, the issue, for example, the subcontractors make up. There is no subcontractors anymore. Everything is made in a factory, is on site itself. You know? um, the labor is less. Today in, in the Gulf region, the primarily is come to 20, 25%, almost eliminated because your construction cycle sh sh jump almost from two years to six months to eight months. You know, and that's obviously save a lot. So we think that we can get to 30% saving. Again, this depends if you are going into hyper construction between steel and concrete, or you go into only steel or into, uh, into concrete. So the, and it's very from country to country, but our experience on the uh, job that we have executed, it achieved almost 30% saving itself. You know? So despite all this positive issue and despite all the good intention and uh, despite the fact that uh, we all know that this is the best way forward and, and our industry is lacking behind, the adaptation of this is only 3% worldwide. You know, why at, at, why at 3% as of 2016? You know, so one of the things that we, in our discussion with the different stakeholders involved in this industry, first of all, it is related to the negative stigma. You know, again, uh, the picture that I showed you before, you know, the utopia of the 60s and what people think about modular construction. 
know, they think modular construction are Borta cabins. Uh, they think it's a temporary condition. The other thing, obviously, there is shortest of precedents. It is not everywhere. There is um, clients, a lot of clients, especially all the new developer, if they don't see it happening, if they don't see a lot of precedent, and then they will say, well, why should we start? No. The procurement strategy, when it comes from the developer all the way to the manufacturer of almost every element of this building, you know, the method of the procurement need to change to enable uh, to, to the, uh, the, the design for manufacturing and assembly. The, the relationship between the developers, the architect, the contractors, and the manufacturer of the need to be changed and need to be rewritten almost. You know? um, very crucial issue, the standard of and, and regulation and the codes of the city itself. But here, for example, if you take the government of Singapore, you will see how successful and how well they have done in almost pushing uh, the design for manufacturing to assembly to the extent that this 3% that I show you worldwide goes to almost 15% when it comes to the Singapore government. But this is all uh, because of the hard working of the Singaporean government to implement these changes and to give incentive to manufacturers, to developers, to designers to do it. The issue of product financing is, is really crucial. Uh, as I mentioned before, architecture, all the financial institution, it's, you know, uh, their system is based on the fact that an architecture project takes three to four years. When they trigger the financing of the, the financing of the project, the payment um, uh, work on that basis. Now you are telling the banks, well, you know, your project financing need to cut down to one and a half years or even less. Uh, uh, from, from four years to one and a half years. I'm talking about design and construction. So it's a big challenge. It's a change of mindset. It, uh, these rules need to be written again itself. Uh, so again, in the one of our biggest uh, and what, what we think is the main factors, I think issue related to financing, to manufacturing, the manufacturing will always follow the lead of the industry itself. You no, know, the contractors will follow the lead. I think the real issue is related to us, the, the architects, the designer itself. We need to trigger the issue that relate to the design for, for manufacturing or an assembly itself, you know, and then we need to change the stigma itself and the representation of the system itself, you know. It really lay in the hand of the designer itself more than anybody else. It's not the, the government need to do that, you know, it's not the developers need to do that. It's in the hand of the designer to trigger this. You know, this is the Statue of Liberty. It was completely pre-made of size, shipped all the way to New York and manufactured and, and, and then assembled on site itself. You know, this is one of like all a prefabricated structure. You know, this is what, what I'm talking about when we talk about, you know, positive social acceptance. You know, it's in the hand of the designers to do this or that. You know itself. You know. Some of the examples in the in the 60s that you um, some of you know about. So, for example, this is the Habitat 67. You know, it was done in the Expo in Montreal itself. It's just to show you some of the early attempt in the 60s and the 70s itself. The Metastats, again, a building that has been built. Uh, this is the kind of Kisho uh, Tower itself, the, the capsule system that we all familiar about, all prefabricated, pre-done and uh, assembled on site. Uh, you see it here today after the recent uh, rehabilitation of it itself. Uh, again, uh, this is the uh, Expo 70 in, um, uh, in Japan. Uh, um, the, you see all, all the, um, the process of the design and construction itself. And again, here, um, this is one of uh, the projects that I really like um, uh, that done. Literally, these are four containers taken together, taken only the frame of the container and they produce this housing unit itself. You know, uh, the project was built and designed in less than six months. You know, it's, it's really all done on site and almost um, moved on site. 
it's it's one of the uh, real demonstration of the recent effort of uh, how fast or how well our, or, or the perception itself um, of, of the manufacturing. So this is the one that um, uh, done in um, um, uh, New York itself, uh, just to demonstrate what how can you do an assemble on site in a very dense city. Again, they show you an example that uh, the design of every element of it was based of how do you assemble it, how do you do it, how do you transport it, uh, the the uh, the traffic rules was taking every every aspect was thought of from a different uh, from all the different level how to assemble on site. This was almost assembled in less than three days. Again, this is one of the building uh, that done. Um, uh, in the UK itself, it was a student housing. Um, this is one of the first tower um, that was done using um, uh, modular construction itself. It was done in Ireland and shipped to the UK itself, the whole building. Um, so uh, for us, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, the uh, all this research and the area, we, we wrote a statement to one of our clients. Um, to for the implementation of uh, modular construction or uh, design for uh, construction, uh, design for manufacturing and assembly itself. So the recommendation goes into uh, uh, five elements. One, to rebrand the image of the prefab, and again here it goes back to the, uh, the uh, responsibility of the architect and the designers itself, the creativity itself uh, to go uh, and introduce all this element. Uh, what I showed you today is one of our attempt where we had a very uh, visionary um, developers who allow us the opportunity to introduce these studies. You know, um, uh, so rebranding the image. But I wanna I wanna talk here also about that. You know, all this the work that you have seen that done by OMA. It's commissioned, i.e. also paid. So we had an opportunity where we had again uh, an open minded developer who gave us uh, commission us to do this study, you know, so he he understood the value uh, of this principle and he commissioned us to do so. But here I go back to an important issue where I think that the academic sector fall behind when it comes uh, to the education of architects uh, into this line of thinking. You know, uh, it's a very small attempt that you see it in a different educational institute, but is not mainstream. You know, when we got architect at OMA and we discuss uh, this, almost nobody have any idea about it, and we really almost get architects. We we have in an office of 300 people. We have almost over 90 different nationality coming from different. Uh, schools, you know, nobody know uh, what we are talking about is never introduced. So I think the academic system have the responsibility right now also, you know, to walk in that direction and introduce, you know, introduce a, a curricula to address the design for manufacturing and, and assembly itself, you know. So architects, uh, as part of their education, they become also uh, a research element financed by different government agency and institute to push to to, to push the uh, the, uh, the the whole principle of of design for manufacturing and assembly itself. You know, Be because not every office, not every architect can afford literally to spend all this amount of research, all all this amount of time. You know, uh, to do uh, to do this work itself if it's not commissioned itself. You no. Know? If it is not a commission, the other thing is to educate the relative stakeholders. And again, here I go uh, to um, uh, the um, the developers itself, uh, the financial institutions, the uh, the, um, um, the the manufacturers itself. So there is a lot of stakeholder involved that need to educate it about the system to push these envelopes. And then, very crucially, the incentive that come from the government. Uh, itself, you know, uh, tax exemptions, uh, restriction on the environmental restriction, noise and restriction can, can, that can push even developers to go in that direction, like what's happened in northern European country, you know. And then 
almost promote the success of, of modular construction and, and um, uh, the uh, um, uh, prefabricated building and use them to, uh, to, to show their success itself. No? No? And, and, and finally, is the, um, uh, like the, what the Singaporean government has done, uh, that the uh, DFMA become as part of the almost a DNA of how the city does uh, development itself. No? As a final note, Einstein said the true definition of madness is repeating the same action over and over, hoping for a different result. You know, in this industry, in my 30 years experience, I worked almost in different sectors also as a developer. Uh, we hired project managers, construction managers, uh, we used every piece of planning software that I can think of. You know, we have never ever managed to achieve any building. We never managed to achieve any design program on time, neither any construction program on time, neither we managed to stick to any budget. You know, uh, whether I worked as a developer or whether we worked as a practicing architect, you know, and we continue to again hire uh, uh, program manager and uh, project managers and uh, putting uh, going into a meeting where there is actually more uh, people trying to control the project than the designers itself, you know, um, and again achieving almost the same negative result. You know, we see the successful examples all around us, you know, in our phones and our keyboard and our mouse in our cars in our even kind of Coca-Cola can, you know, there is success story all around us, but we still uh, lack behind. There is actually one element that I did not mention that it is, I witnessed it myself, is the, um, is the oil platform and the kind of uh, that float in the sea itself. So these are all building, super building that completely done off-site and assembled on site, on uh, on site, in a very kind of exceptional condition like the oceans. No, so again, the successful story is all around us, but it is we just not taking this leap forward. Uh -huh. That's that's all I have to say, and I look forward for your questions. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, that, that was that was really enlightening. Um, we do have some questions. We've got it seems to be maybe 13. We'll try to limit them if you don't have much time, but we'll see how we go. Uh, first question: uh, Manufacturing construction industries have inherent differences. This goes back to the beginning of your your talk. In your opinion, how can this be overcome, specifically regarding economies of scale and product definition? For example, in the first product. Are defined early on with little or no uh, end user customization and can be rolled out um, into millions of products. Whereas in construction, the end product is highly customizable or customized potentially with a one off final product being produced, as in you potentially aren't going to do cookie cutter buildings and repeat it. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, but, but but I don't think we will be limited uh, to um, a, a single line of product itself. You know, uh, the whole idea is that the uh, many um, the design itself um, can easily adopt different existing elements you know, um, uh, that exists in the market of the shelf element and then our creativity itself as architects and designer, the, uh, the articulation and the manipulation of the element itself can offer you endless uh, possibilities. You know, um, so uh, I, I think it's really uh, the marrying between kind of what can you use of the existing element and what can you introduce, you know, I mean today you know, not every architect need to be sit and design uh, in, an, uh, in an office itself. You know, uh, I think architects should also uh, shift uh, their focus into working in issue. And, and there are a lot of architects who focus on uh, re, uh, related to materiality. I'm working with a company in Amsterdam, for example, there's a bunch of architects who designed robotic arms to do 3D printing. 
you know, and uh, so I think this again, it go back to the responsibility of the architect to, to push this envelope and to show the level of the uh, the level of uh, creativity into the uh, design for manufacturing and assembly. And I think one thing that I'd just add from my side and just an observation, I recently looked up the revised Reba plan of work and now the Reba plan of work, which we obviously operate on at MIDC as, as a great benchmark for the stages of project development stages and alike, it's now construction and manufacturing. So I think Reba has probably taken that on board as well and it's not just for construction, but it's also for manufacturing. So I think it's probably some change at the top in regards to sort of looking at modular construction as something that's here to stay and how they can therefore evolve their practice and their stages to align with that as well. So I thought that was that was interesting to see that that sort of change from Reba is now incorporating that sort of manufacturing side as well. Yeah, I go mean, ahead. I'm uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Mark. No, go ahead, go ahead, Yad. No, I'm just saying, um, um, it's uh, uh, for me, sometimes it's a bit frustrating is the, the speed of adaptation to this. You know, I mean, when you see how the technology industry almost um, exaggerate, you know, we cannot cope up with how many phones and, and, or cars for that sake. I mean, a cycle of a car used to be every five years, today a cycle of a car using exactly the same economic is every one year, but it shows you also again the level of, pro of productivity. You know, when uh, uh, the industrial designers, not architects, uh, who are designing all this object around us, their education is based on modular and, 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 and the standardization. Our education does not offer this, and this is the difference. You know, so the academic has to intervene here, you know, I think. No problem at all. I see Mark. That that no great. And I might just take it over from Mark. I see he may have one of his um children in the background potentially. So no, um, good. Yeah. so I, I guess onto the to the next question. And I, this is something that we've discussed before as well. Iad, who benefits from not evolving the construction industry? And I guess who's responsible for limiting innovation? This is one of the questions that came through on on the Q and A. I mean, we spoke about how sort of construction has been limited and it hasn't really evolved since you know for a you know for quite quite a number of years who benefits from this in your in your thoughts but but i i don't think uh, there is there is a malicious in my opinion there is a like a, a, a some kind of corporate conspiracy to to limit this is literally is the is the kind of classical way of doing things you know uh, the abundance uh, bear in mind that the uh, the uh, the developed world is almost built and now there is more and more attempt to rethink existing condition. Uh, the real build-up is going to take shape um, in places uh, or are taking shape in places like China, like India, like Sub-Saharan Africa, like South America. There is an um, intense amount of development is taking place and, and I think it is a responsibility also of the of the developer architect like us who are operating in this country to instead of introducing a, another icon in the sky of, of uh, Shanghai is to introduce this kind of um, uh, this kind of uh, method uh, and, and mindset into the construction because I think the resources of Earth cannot handle another industrial res uh, uh, revolution like it happened in the West. You know, uh, between India and, and China, there are 3 billion people. If they have to go through the cycle that the US and the Western Europe went through, there will be nothing left of on this earth. You know, so I think it is a responsibility that we also have to take, you know, to uh, to push for this kind of uh, systems. You know, uh, but I think it is, again, is one of the things that uh, the, the uh, I'm not kind of uh, blaming an ideology where capitalism and the cycle uh, maximizing profit, whether it is manufacturing, uh, whether it is coming from a developer because of using uh, cheap labors, uh, uh, to all this kind of different element, they will continue the status quo without, you know, taking a break, you know, thinking backward uh, at the way. The, the, the issue is that you can benefit financially from it. Something that, for example, the car industry found out, you know, and implemented, and they are benefiting from it financially. You know? So again, I think it, it needs to go back to 
to the academic uh, institutions uh, to, to push for this system. And again, independent body who continue to finance this kind of studies, no, and publish it for that sake. You know, this work that you have, I showed you behind us, you know, uh, it, it's uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the work of OMA on this aspect itself, it's OMA work, you know, S some of this work we cannot even publish, you know, uh, uh, b because of all kind of intellectual copyright and contract and so on. You know? Thank you. One more question for you. Um, I guess this question is about scale and size of um, construction automation. So a lot of the examples are smaller, shoes, cars. Uh, do you think there's limitations on the size in the future for what uh, will limit the creativity or limit the, uh, the scale of the project, I guess, or have impact on the scale of the project? Well, I don't know. This question must be early also in the talk because as you can mm. see, the, the, the towers in Mara Island and Abu Dhabi, uh, it's uh, high-rise towers, no? Um, I mean, you can uh, theoretically, again, the the ambition of the British architects in, in Al Shikra movement in the 60s, uh, it shows again that you can block and unblock the city. No, I, I, I don't think there's any kind of limitation of how how much you can introduce a modular construction or design for manufacturing and assembly. It's again, it falls in in our hand and our you know creativity, you know, uh, to uh, to think about different conditions. You no, know? uh, not is not to not to stuck behind uh, uh, computers and, and and draw lines anymore, but to think what is the impact of every material about the environment, how to deal with it. You no. Know? What is the new material we have to consider? How to utilize more localized material as much as we can? And again, stop this vicious cycle of, of shipping and cycling and importing, you no? Know? So I think there is a lot of aspect that we can take to, and uh, it is not one fixed solution for everything, but it is actually, uh, it need a lot of localization, a lot of customization uh, uh, that falls from locality, culture, society, social, financial, and and um, uh, environmental. Um, Fair enough. But could I uh, respond with, uh, doesn't it have some restrictions currently in today's day and age with uh, transportation, uh, whether it be marine or even road? I mean, you can possibly bypass some of that with uh, more uh, innovative solutions like a helicopter perhaps of transport, but shipping by a uh, truck, for instance, that does limit your modular size, uh, one might say, right? At least in today's yeah, day and age. Again, as, 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 I, as I showed uh, before that we, uh, for specifically when we designed for Abu Dhabi, uh, this building, we uh, took at the, about the traffic law. Um, again, mm. the traffic law, for example, in Abu Dhabi offered escorted transportation with police non-escorted. We selected non-escorted because we wanted free movement, no? And so on. So uh, I really think that all these logistical issues are really minor, you know, in, in, in front of, um, um, uh, you know, our creativity and what we can think of, you know, to overcome these logistical issues. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, do you think that the MENA region is more, um, how do you think it's different than, say, Europe is? I mean, one could say Europe is far more advanced in terms of um, automated construction. Um, how do you feel, uh, I know you're doing it here successfully, yeah. but what do you feel are maybe the, um, some points you could point out um, locally that are, uh, you know, are uh, you're acutely aware of locally? as opposed to, say, um, in other more um, possibly advanced regions or different regions? Uh, you know, I, I think the one of the challenges that we, we confronted in, in the Gulf region was was mainly also related to one code uh, and to the kind of uh, uh, the municipalities or the authority comprehension of the whole system. This is one, one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect is really, again, uh, modular mean cheap. You know, prefabricated monchi. Uh, uh, so again, you have to take them, you have to show them, you have to educate them. And I'm talking about um, um, uh, the developer themselves. Uh, we we took a whole uh, group of uh, municipality from Abu Dhabi to show them how things are done. 
you know, so there was a whole kind of ed ed education system uh, that need to be introduced. But uh, I think the bigger problem in, in the Gulf region is how the project financing is done. This need to rethought of. The other aspect is uh, the the issue of the contractors themselves. No, uh, uh, the, uh, the how the contractors operate, you know, and where they make their profit margins. You know, it's a quite a, a, a quite a system that been there for the like 30, 40 years. You're asking them now to rethink about the whole system. You know. Uh, the claim system, the change orders, um, you know, and, and so, you know, there is a change of culture. So that's why, you know, uh, when when you trigger a company, make a modular system, you, when you think about it, you say, am I a manufacturer or am I a contractor? You know, and so there is a lot of kind of mindset that need to set in, you know, and, and need to be uh, adopted. But I think it is achievable and uh, uh, and I feel that actually um, in, in the Gulf region specifically, there is more opportunity to introduce this uh, because if the authority took a more firm stand to it, you know, and, uh, and adopt, for example, what the Singaporean government did uh, as a standard adopted into, let's say, in the municipality of Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Kuwait and so on. Um, and uh, this adaptation will definitely push the the principle and the mindset. Thank you very very much, uh, Iad. Um, it's been really a uh, pleasure hearing you speak today. Um, I think that we're going to probably call it uh, at this point. We've uh, badgered you with enough questions. <laughs> thank you. But uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us your time. It was uh, a pleasure hearing you speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Right. Is there anything else? Is there anything else you want to uh, leave with, or no, are you I'm good? I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you for right. the Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, we conclude our uh, our webinar. Thank you, guys. Bye.